I'm going to be doing a teaching this morning. I'm putting on my teacher's hat this morning. And I, I got, I got, I got uh, so deep into the stuff that I started looking at the Greek and the Hebrew, and it became Greek to me eventually. And it became <laughs> very murky. But I, I realized something about faith. I realize we talk about faith all the time, but do we really understand when we use the word faith? When we use this word faith, do we really understand what we are talking about? Do we really understand the dynamics or the dimensions of faith? Because faith has different dimensions in different circumstances, and faith, throughout the Bible, it was applied in different ways. We know that our faith is based in Jesus. We know that. That's the foundation of our faith. We stand upon that foundation. Jesus Christ, there's no other foundation we can build on. We don't build upon George. We don't build upon Julius. We don't build upon Apollos. We don't build upon Paul. But we build on that one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And when we don't build on the open door. We build on one foundation, and it's Jesus. This morning, church service is about Jesus. The worship is about Jesus. The witnessing is about Jesus. Deliverance is about Jesus. And whatever prophecy is about Jesus at the end of the day, and it points to Him. The whole Bible is geared towards Jesus, and the message that we preach this morning is the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, and it's the truth, and it's the word of God, and it's good news to you this morning. And so we have faith in the word of God. Amen. And that's why I'm going to unpack a little bit. You see those suitcases on the stage? I'm going to unpack them a little bit this morning, one by one. I'm going to take you to a Greek word, and then I'm going to take you to five Hebrew words. So we're speaking a little bit of Hebrew and Greek here this morning, but that's good because we need to understand what God really wants to tell us about faith because many Christians use the word faith loosely. They use the word faith, but they never apply the word faith. They never actually practice faith. They speak about faith, and when tough times come, people tell you, you must have faith, Craig. And then you go, what does that actually mean, to have faith? What does it actually mean? How do I do it? Where do I start? And so I took the very old cliche scripture out of Hebrews 11, because one guy even said, I think it was Derek Prince, he said that it's one of the only words that he knows of in the Bible where they needed to give a definition. Isn't that amazing? A true definition to say, this is faith. Now, Hebrews 11 verse 1, 2, 3 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Isn't this a powerful definition of what faith is? And so today we're going to take the two dimensions out of this scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, Verse 1 to 3, there's two dimensions to faith this morning, and we can also use the word faithfulness in that name of faith, because if you go to the original writings, you see that the word faithfulness plays a huge role in the word faith. Amen. And so we're going to go to the two dimensions. Go to the next slide for me, and we need to get through this. Faith provides a guarantee, number one. It's the substance of things hoped for. It provides a guarantee, a line on which we hang our hopes on. That guarantee. So faith is your guarantee that you can put your hope in Christ, in the Word of God, in what Christ has accomplished for you, the promises of God. You can stand there and say, faith is that assurance of the things I hope for that I read in the Word of God that it will come to pass. You spoke about imagination. It's more like hope. It's more like hope in Christ. It's more like, yes, we use our imagination, but it's more than that. It's on a, on a foundation of the Word of God. Amen. So it must be attached to the Word of God. And so your hope is in that place. It's got a substance to it. Faith has got that substance inside of you. It's something tangible. Amen. It's something that God can use. So when you have faith in the Word of God, your hopes will come true. Amen. And so you hang on that line the hopes. You hang on the line of faith. So faith provides a guarantee. Faith moves us forward. How many of you know it's better to drive forward than to reverse? How many of you pranked your car when you reversed, when you didn't see that little pole? Because, uh, you know, years ago we didn't have a beep, 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 beep. I don't know if you saw those uh, YouTube clips where they put a, put a small guy in the boot that opens the boot like that, and as they drive towards the wall, the guy at the back goes beep, 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 beep. As it gets closer to the wall. So maybe some of you, if you need a small guy to get into your boot, you can pay him per day. If you don't have sensors at the back of your car, you can make a plan and put a small guy in the boot. Any small guys volunteering this morning? Anybody need a job? We'll pay you 50 cents a day. 
<laughs> Amen. Okay. So faith moves you forward into an unseen future. And I think this is the difficulty of faith, that we cannot see the things yet. They haven't manifested in this realm yet. They are still available to us in the spiritual realm. And that's why faith takes hold of the things that we cannot see. It propels us forward into the future. That which God has for us prepared already before the foundations of the earth. I mean, how many of you know that God prepared every good work for you, Sean? Billy? God prepared every good work. We must find those works to do and get busy with it, but it's going to take faith because you can't see it yet. We can't see yet how many people want to come to church. We can't see yet who's going to be healed this morning, but we know that it's available in the kingdom of God. We know that it's available in the spirit. So when you begin to pray, you are moved forward into the unseen, into the future. Isn't that powerful? Listen to this. God had promised Sarah or Sarah and Abram countless descendants and a land that God would reveal to them, but both promises were things that were not seen. And the fact is, that's why Sarah laughed, because she was so old already. I think she was 92 years old when God gave them this promise. It's like, uh, okay, Abram, maybe you can father these children. Who's going to give birth to these children at the age of 92? It's a laughing matter. Eh? Come on. And she laughed because she couldn't believe it. Out of unbelief, she actually laughed, saying, this is unbelievable. At the age of 92, God gives, me, God gives us two promises. He says that he's going to give you countless descendants, and he's going to take you to the land that God would still reveal to you, which you don't know where you're going yet. Isn't it powerful that God, in that Hebrews 11, if we read it, the, the account of them are mentioned there of Abram. The faith of Abram that was accounted to them as righteousness. He put his faith in God. We need to hold on to the promise of God and to move forward into the future which God has for us. How many of you know that God's promises are unshakable? Yes, it might sound like a cliche, go and find a scripture. I'm telling you this morning, you need to find a scripture to stand on. You need to find in the Word of God what God wants to tell you in this season. You can't find it on Google well, unless you are Googling the Scriptures, you can't find it from a friend. You can't find it anywhere else. But God wants to speak to you intimately and personally. And He's in a personal and intimate God. And He loves you so much that He doesn't want to keep you in the dark. He wants to reveal His will to you. But are you ready to lay down everything else for His will? Are you ready to lay down every other ambition that you have, every other desire that's not of God, every other thing? Are you willing to come before God and say, God, speak to me? You see, because every now and then we need to come to that place. I've found in my life over and over again, I need to come to this place where God refreshes my faith again by the promises that He gives me. You see, some of you received prophetic words years ago. Am I right? Still waiting for it. Eh? I can say to you, there's some prophetic words that I received over my life, and I'm not just basing it on the prophets and the people that gave it to me, but I'm saying there are some prophetic words that I feel still needs to come to pass, and I know, I can feel in my spirit that something that God spoke to me about, where He confirmed it to me in the time that I spent with Him. You see, when we go to, from prophet to prophet to find prophetic words, and we don't spend time with God, it becomes dangerous. You know why it becomes dangerous? Because you cannot discern if it is of God. You see, God will begin to speak to you yourself, and He will begin to confirm things down the line if you begin to pray. When you've received the prophetic word, what do you need to do? You need to pray. And then you need to get into the word. And then God will begin to confirm it through His word over and over again to you, and you'll see those things will come to pass. Those things will come into place. And sometimes there's something that doesn't sit right with the prophetic word. You need to kick that one out like a dead bone. Not the person, the word. Okay, some of you are like, woo, it's aggressive in this church, eh? They kick people out like dead bones. Don't misquote me. Nobody working for the media? Anyone working for the Herald here this morning? Just checking in case I need to say controversial things. Amen. <laughs> Let's go to the Greeks and see what they say about faith. How many of you want to know what the Greeks say about faith? How many of you studied Greek? None of you. Okay, me neither. Amen. Faith, what do the Greeks say? Faith is an active word and not a passive word. To follow God and to do what He asks. The Greek word pistis, or pistis, as the Greeks would say, because I hear they pronounce their words like so funny. Believe equals belief or trust. There's two aspects to this word, and this comes out of Romans chapter 10. 
to believe in God that you don't perish. That's where the word pistis comes from. To believe in God and have faith in God that you won't perish. That's what comes out of Romans chapter 10. The word belief was an intellectual assent. In other words, you came in agreement with it because you saw the, the, the facts of it and you believe, your belief in the truth is sufficient evidence. Amen. God has given you sufficient evidence. That is part of the word faith here this morning in the Greek, the pistis word, which means belief. You have an intellectual part of faith. When you saw the evidence in the Bible, when you saw the facts, how many of you love facts? You say, well, without the facts, I can't make any decisions. I mean, so God gave you the facts in his words. There was an intellectual agreement with it that came through the belief in it. Now, how many of you know this is not enough? We have too many people that stop here halfway. They stop by belief and they don't go over to the second part of that word, which means trust. You see, we can believe, and why did I put James 2 verse 19 in? Because James 2 verse 19 says, even the demons believe and tremble. So they do half faith. They can even do half faith. In other words, we can be in church and we can say, I believe in the word. But when the tacky hits the tar, are you going to have the trust in God? Are you going to put your faith in God? Because that's where the second part of the word faith comes in. It says trust is reliance and commitment to the decision you made to believe in God. Amen. The faith that you have in God. When things get tough in your life, do you stop believing? No. Sometimes I do. <laughs> Just for a short while. Just for that short while, doubt comes in. There is also the human element in this. But may it end up at the end of the week or at the end of the day where I say, no, 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 this is nonsense. I'm going to believe what the Word of God says. I'm going to put my trust in it. David wrote it in the Psalms over and over again. He was under persecutions. His enemies want to kill him. But at the end of the day, he praised God. He said, God, you are still faithful. God, you are still able. God, you are still my deliverer. You see, he kept on proclaiming statements of faith over his situation. Never mind what my situation looks like. It might be the truth that I see with my own eyes, the intellectual part of it, but there needs to be a trusting part in faith that goes over and to say, I believe God, whatever he says is the truth. Amen. And if that's the truth, it settles it. How many of you can have a trust in God like that? And we need to work on that trust issue. Over this COVID time, and just before COVID even, I've seen some of our congregants and other people out in the community, when tough times hit, maybe it's illness, maybe it's financial problem, people get angry with God. You know, anger with God can lead to a very bad place. Anger with God can lead you away from the, the community of Christians because, you know, when someone is angry, they push everyone else away. Just test your own heart a little bit. When you get angry with God, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't even realize that actual fact what's happened with you is because of the situation in your life, there's actually a little bit of bitterness and anger towards God. And that thing will become a block in your life towards God. And the faith will not grow. And you won't allow other people to come and speak and encourage. In actual fact, when people try and encourage you, you say, no, sorry, I don't want your encouragement. I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to hear about prayer. I don't want to hear about coming to church. When Pastor Devold phones some people, they say, stop phoning me. Sorry, I'll stop phoning you. Next week, I'll phone you again. <laughs> we say, Devold, have you phoned? Julius, have you checked? So we're not going to stop. None of us on staff are going to stop to phone. None of us are going to stop to care because at the end of the day, we're saying, do you trust God? Can you push through on that issue to trust the Lord? Because He is trustworthy. You can rely upon Him. Reliance is in the truth and the commitment to it. Trusting it to be true. Your reliance is not upon some story. Your reliance is upon the solid truth of God's Word. And we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is Jesus that you put your trust in. It's your reliance that's in a solid thing. The Word of God will not move. It's like a rock. It will not be moved by circumstance, by political atmosphere or, or political uh, winds that are blowing at the moment. God's word will stay true right until Jesus comes back, amen, to fetch his bride. The word of God is solid. You can trust upon it. Put your trust in him. Amen.